opportunities and different kinds of opportunities to um, have our two worshiping communities be together more often. So, thank you. Good morning. morning. Please join me in our gathering words. Come into the Messiah's bright and dazzling light. The day of God's kingdom dawns. Come to learn from the Son of Man, the one who makes sense of this human life. Come to follow the Son of God who shines with love and power, who lights our way into a world in need of good news. O Holy One, on mountaintops and valley floors, you reveal to us the light of your love. Our heart's desire is to ask in this amazing glory of the divine presence. With each encounter, we are changed and transformed. Draw us nearer that we might receive a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Help us, O Holy One, to live our lives as a reflection of divine glory. May we walk among our brothers and sisters as a blessing bearing light into the dark places, hope to displace despair, and love that casts out hate. Maybe then we will hear your voice speaking to us, saying, Listen to my child, the Beloved.
The presence of God surrounds us, and yet too often we go about our daily lives oblivious to the power of the Holy Spirit moving in our midst. Let us together confess the ways in which we are blind to God's ever-present care. You invite us to a new way of life, O God, based in honesty and trust, following you into the fullness of life and death and new life, with all the ups and downs. We confess that we don't like to think of the hard parts, and we prefer to turn away when we see suffering coming towards us or those we love. We admit that we have even tried to protect you, stepping in front and trying to change your way to fit our own comfort and idea of success. Forgive us when we impose our limited understanding on you. Guide us to take our proper place following you, rather than trying to lead you. Show us how to orient ourselves to you, so that all else fits together for your big picture, and your light shines out through us. Amen. On mountaintops and in valleys, in our homes and in our hearts, God knows us better than we know ourselves. And God forgives us when we cannot forgive ourselves. By God's mercy, we are forgiven. By God's mercy, we are made whole. By God's mercy, we are equipped to serve others. Thanks be to God. Amen. The one who said, let light shine, has shone in our hearts and illumined our lives with knowledge of the glory of God through the face of Jesus Christ. Let us share this grace and peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Reveal your presence to us this day, O God of light, love, and glory. As you did to your servants at the foot of the mountain, send your spirit to show us your story. May the brilliance of your face illuminate this place as we dare to proclaim your word, and may we, your people, be never unable to tell all that we have heard. Amen. Amen. Today's first reading is from Mark chapter 8 verses 27 through chapter 9, verse 1, and I will be reading from the Common English Bible. Jesus and his disciples went to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They told him, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, And what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples. 
the human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed, and then, after three days, rise from the dead. He said this plainly, but Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, then sternly corrected Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. After calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the human one will be ashamed of that person when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus continued, I assure you that some standing here won't die before they see God's kingdom arrive in power. Word of the Lord.
After having heard that choral anthem twice today, I can tell you I've already been to the mountaintop two times. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. The gospel for today is taken from the gospel according to Mark. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. The transfiguration story that you just heard is probably one of the big Christian stories that all of us have to deal with in one way, shape, or form. For those of you who struggle with the idea of physical miracles, happily this story can easily be neutralized fairly easily. It's not hard to imagine Jesus caught in the blinding glory of the midday sun, his likeness affected by the magic that fast-floating clouds can play on our vision. We understand the lack of precise memory in moments of great emotion, and we too have probably heard in our hearts voices that others never heard. And even if those accommodations are not quite enough to satisfy, almost anyone who acknowledges the breadth and vastness of the Jesus movement can admit that transformative, unforgettable moments must have occurred often in the lives of those early believers for them to be so emboldened. If it didn't happen just like this, one might say, well, then it probably should have. The way, however, that the story has been memorialized in the church is much more than otherworldly. Jesus, looking for all the world like many people think Jesus should, banked by Elijah and Moses, adored by the startled Peter, James, and John. I mean, this story doesn't get any better. And yet, if we regard this story simply as a romanticized vision, we, the church, risk becoming more and more out of touch. The risk is that we become a museum, a nice museum in the case of Christ the Lord Lutheran Church, a nice museum in the case of First Presbyterian Church. But if we don't wrestle with this story, we're just two museums. Now don't get me wrong. Museums can change lives, acquainting us with nearly unspeakable beauty and artistry. Church lays claim to deeper and more penetrating transformation than just that. All of which is to say that we take our annual hearing of this remarkable story on the eve of a new Lent. We do well to ask ourselves if indeed it's time for another 
new current life mountaintop experience. How long has it been since we've felt our spirits soar in the presence of a God moment? When was the last time for you? Do we languish in a world of intellectualism and materialism that's left us people who have trouble imagining an encounter with God that would rock us to the core of our being? That's true of us. And today, let's hear a call of God to get ourselves up to a mountaintop again. And let's do it quickly. If hearing the story of the transfiguration does nothing else but move us momentarily into a deeper personal search for God, then we have done a good day's work. But the message on my heart this morning is broader than that. It resides in a place that's deeper than even an important call to reignite our own personal devotions. It seems to me that it's time for the church to go back to the mountaintop to either get some new operating instructions or more likely to hear again with new ears the instructions delivered by the glowing Christ. Can we say that both of our congregations are rarely packed on Sunday mornings? And it seems to me that the message that these disciples received, whether on the top of the mountain, which we've just heard, or more likely simply in the course of their lives with Jesus, is a message that ought to bring scores of people into the house of worship every week. Listen again to what those disciples heard. From the voice presumed to be God, they heard a voice that said, Listen to him. Listen to the beloved, my son. And from Jesus himself, they heard, Get up and don't be afraid. The hope of the movement depends upon our willingness to hear those same instructions in our context, in our time. Listen to him. Get up. And don't be afraid. Listen to him, the voice said. Listen to him when he says things like, love like you have never loved before. Don't let the least of those around you be without no one can be hungry or thirsty or naked or alone. Listen to him. Listen to him when he says, be like children in your openness and joy of life. Listen to him when he says, don't allow there to be any outcasts in the church. Zero, none. Don't allow it. Listen to him. The church's hope for remaining alive and vibrant rests on our belief, our knowing that Christ still speaks and that the instructions to listen to him still apply. The moment of transfiguration is locked in time, then we're lost. If it continues, there is no end to what we can become. Get up and don't be afraid. So often found among the recalled sayings of Jesus, there can be little doubt that Jesus regularly said something like, don't be afraid. I say this as one who is oftentimes maybe constantly afraid myself. There are no more encouraging words in the gospel than those. 
But Jesus didn't say, don't be afraid, just so that we'll feel better. Jesus said, let go of your fear so that you could really listen to me and follow my instructions for life, even when it's hard and even when people oppose you. And they will. And from the very beginning, it's not been easy. We've constantly attempted to narrow the love of God to make it compatible with our capacity to understand. When Peter implored Jesus to settle down on the mountaintop forever, he foreshadowed how hard it would be for us to truly hear the instructions given. Peter wanted to construct dwellings, little monuments maybe, that would mark and preserve moment, the moment to keep everything just like it was. And Jesus heard in that sentence the immediate impulse of the church when we succumb to that same kind of inclination when we say let's just keep it the same let's keep it the way it's always been what peter really wanted to build was an altar to the truth that he knew he wanted to say i found it all that we ever need to know about what is true and correct, Peter wanted to say, exists here with me right now. He wanted to say, let's just drop anchor and stay here. My good Lord, how the church has lived and continues to live that one out. Every movement the church has made to broaden its understanding of truth in the light of progress or change or evolution has been made with fear and trembling and usually with much resistance. Why? Because we believe that we have to control orthodoxy. We have to be the ones that can manage it. Truth, somehow, we think is a static possession of ours. And although we've been shown over and over the truth develops as we progress, we resist change. A brief example. Nothing has been harder in our present church culture than the notion of what is true about human relationships. I mean, the church has taught for centuries that LGBTQ folk, if they were accepted into the church, would be the end of the church. And that we would destroy all of your straight marriages. But it didn't happen. We can let go and grow. Monuments of truth almost always must have an expansion plan. Given what we know about how hard it was for Peter to extend the Jesus movement to Gentiles, arguing in essence that to become a follower of Jesus, a person had to become a Jew, my guess is that another dwelling in his perfect world on that mountaintop, besides a dwelling of truth, would have been a dwelling of perfect, holy, righteous worship with the perfect practice. And whose practice would that be? Would it look like Lutherans? Would it look like Presbyterians? Jesus never said a word, not one single word, about how worship should be performed. Not one. It wasn't that important to him. Does that mean that he didn't care about worship? I don't know, but it does seem that we are in a generation of rules about practice that have nothing to do with Jesus. 
Many churches of our ilk require that for a person to be baptized, that a, for, to be able to receive communion, a person must be baptized. I don't know. Is that the way it is in your church? Good. Because the Bible doesn't say anything like that. Jesus never said anything about that. But it has become a part of the core belief that people have. And we can drop it. And listen again with a new ear. And see where God is taking us today. How God is calling us to grow. And we don't have to be afraid of the new vision that God gives us to love and serve to the end of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. God with us, you refuse to stand apart, to hover above, to step back from your beloved creation. We thank you for your presence in our midst and for your insistence that those who bear your name be present in the midst of all that goes on in the world. You are here, walking the journey of life through the shadowed valleys, the nights of weeping, the hurts and disappointments with us. Bless those who suffer with comfort and joy dawning with the morning light. You are here, witnessing the power struggles, the greed and self-centeredness, the brokenness of the systems that shape our thinking the seeming impossibility of change. 
bless us with imagination to allow your new thing to spring forth and the political will to seek the common good. You are here, showing us what love looks like in action and inviting us into relationship, teaching us how to be in community with one another, insisting on truth and reconciliation rather than judgment and fear. Bless those whose relationships struggle and those who are isolated and lonely. Bless them with the nurturing wholeness of your gracious presence. You are here. And though the ways of the world would rather you weren't, though the temptation to sequester ourselves somewhere safe with you is strong, though the path ahead will not be easy, we pray you would bring us with you as you head down the mountain again into the fray, bringing your love and peace and justice all, revealing your kingdom come with power among us, even now. We ask in the name of the Son, who shines as light of the world, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward? In a world of shadows and clouds, we are invited to proclaim the light of Christ. As the plates are passed today, may light guide our thoughts and help us know how to give of ourselves and our gifts so that we may become light in a shadowy world.
God of light and love, shine through the gifts we bring before you now. Speak through our hearts and our actions. Bless our gifts, our offerings, and our very lives, that we may bless others with your presence. Amen. Receive now the blessing. God who names you, Christ who claims you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, bless you now and remain with you always. Amen. Please join us for a little bit of refreshment and fellowship. 